Hi, this is Chris McKaylee, and on today's video podcast, I wanted to discuss legislative versus regulatory lobbying. Now, in my mind, and this isn't defined anywhere, I see two main types of lobbying in the state of California, legislative and regulatory. Some might add budget and procurement lobbying, although I see budget as being a subset of legislative lobbying, although clearly budget advocacy has its own set of rules and terminology and players. And I see procurement lobbying as a subset of regulatory lobbying with a lot of the same activities that a lobbyist does at the regulatory level occurring in procurement advocacy. But again, in my mind, the two main types are lobbying the legislative branch of government and lobbying the executive branch of government. And I feel at their core, legislative lobbying is advocating for or against legislation in the legislative branch, while regulatory lobbying is advocating for or against regulations in the rulemaking process in the executive branch of government. So let's discuss each one a little bit. Um, As a brief overview of legislative lobbying, naturally a legislative lobbyist versus a regulatory lobbyist or even a procurement lobbyist is either focused on the federal Congress or or a state legislature. So he or she represents clients naturally before the legislative branch of government and expresses positions of a client on pending legislation as well as budgets um, and budgetary matters that are considered by the legislative branch. For legislative lobbyists operating in the state of California, they obviously interact with state legislators, those who are elected to the two houses of the California legislature, including the 80 members of the state assembly and the 40 members of the state senate. In addition, they lobby the staff to these legislators and the staff of the 33 assembly standing committees and 22 Senate standing committees that embody the policy and fiscal committees of the California State Legislature. And as a part of lobbying state legislation, you'll also interact with the governor's office and relevant state agencies and departments that have uh, jurisdiction over the subject matter of legislation. These legislative lobbyists may work for a single employer, such as a company or an association, or they may work for a lobbying firm that that represents one or more clients. Legislative lobbyists, their goals are to obviously educate officials and their staff about their client interests and then advocate attempting to, you know, influence decisions of these elected officials and the impact of their votes on the client's interests. Legislative lobbyists, similar to regulatory or procurement lobbyists, have to have certain skill sets and including the right personality to excel, uh, good working relationships with officials and staff, some subject matter expertise, knowledge about the process, here obviously the legislative process. And those established relationships will enable access to these decision makers in their efforts to, you know, influence the votes on legislation. So legislative lobbyists will spend most of their time meeting with elected officials and their staff on behalf of their clients to educate and to advocate. Legislative lobbyists also prepare briefing materials such as one pagers, leave behinds or letters of support or opposition they'll prepare other documents, they will appear before committees and, uh, you know, represent their client interests. By the nature of their profession, you know, legislative lobbyists have to review proposed bills and amendments and determine their relevancy to clients. They'll track these bills through the legislative process from introduction to policy committee hearings and votes to fiscal committees in the floor, and then obviously repeat that process in the other house. And once that legislative process concludes, 
then these lobbyists have to work with the governor's office and relevant state agencies and departments as final consideration is given to those bills. These legislative lobbyists also are going to work with their clients throughout the legislative process to help understand and explain the implications and the impact of bills to recommend a course of action and help navigate their clients' issues or bill positions through the legislative process. As to the regulatory lobbying, um, you know, sometimes the regulatory agency provides a new venue or opportunity to continue the battle that may have been lost or even won in the legislative process. Sometimes it means defending your legislative success or perhaps trying to achieve a better result than you had gotten in the legislative process. The state's regulatory process here in California is certainly an integral part of developing public policy in the state. It's its own world of rules and procedures and calendars. It's all governed by the state's Administrative Procedure Act, APA, which is patterned after the federal APA. The APA found in the government code establishes the rulemaking process and the standards that have to be followed by the 200 plus executive branch state agencies in the state of California. Now there are some lobbyists who do regulatory advocacy on the side and some who specialize in dealing with the rulemaking process and who helps uh, or these lobbyists help their clients meaningfully engaged uh, in the public policy comment period uh, in writing or the formal administrative hearing for verbal advocacy. And of course, as the legislative lobbyist navigates the legislative process, so too the regulatory lobbyist navigates the agency process for the adoption and amendment of regulations. However, many lobbyists don't end up operating in the regulatory world. They generally focus exclusively on the legislative venue. The regulatory process is often left, for example, to lawyers who are practicing in those particular policy areas. For example, those who are in energy and telecommunications with the Public Utilities Commission or the California Energy Commission, perhaps environmental issues, uh, such as at the Department of Toxic Substances Control. So these state administrative entities they can engage in both what we call quasi-judicial and quasi-legislative activities. So when they engage in interpreting and enforcing the laws, when they license and regulate, for example, professions and vocations and occupations, they are engaging in their quasi-judicial activities. When they engage in rulemaking or the adoption of amendment of regulations or amending regulations or even repealing regulations, those agencies are then engaging in what we call their quasi-legislative activities. And generally speaking, the authority of these state agencies and departments, their boards and commissions and councils, they adopt policies through rulemaking. And again, that rulemaking is defined and restricted by statute. And a statute that's enacted by the legislature uh, prescribes the agency's authority to adopt regulation. And so they get that uh, authority through delegation of the lawmaking authority from the legislative branch to the executive branch agencies. Some statutes by the legislature confer broad powers to some agencies that affect the general public, like the Department of Motor Vehicles, the DMV, or the Air Resources Board, CARB, uh, places like the uh, Department of Fair Employment and Housing, now called the Civil Rights Department. And interested parties have, hopefully, some significant access to and the ability to participate in the rulemaking process. Again, this is found in the California Administrative Procedure Act. And every agency is required to annually adopt what they call a rulemaking calendar pursuant to state law that basically describes the planned regulatory actions that the agency anticipates engaging in in the upcoming calendar year. From my perspective, I think that the central principle of the APA 
is that the state agency has to provide notice and the opportunity to be heard and that they have to consider recommendations or objections from the public before they adopt or change a regulation that isn't specifically exempted from the APA process. And note that the APA is overseen by the Office of Administrative Law, OAL, another acronym in the rulemaking process. There are a number of instances where the public can participate in an agency rulemaking activity. And this, of course, is where the regulatory lobbyist comes into play, such as commenting on the initial proposal or comments on the modifications to that proposal the formal 45-day comment period, the public hearing. Um, so there's a number of opportunities there. And just like making effective comments in the legislative process, a uh, regulatory lobbyist wants to make effective comments in the rulemaking process, which similar to legislative lobbying requires an understanding of the process and the law, the statutes, other factual material that an agency is relying on in proposing the regulation. Uh, you certainly need a uh, thorough understanding of what is being proposed by the regulation. What is it intended to do? And the six standards, the six standards by which OAL uh, reviews these regulations to determine if those six standards were uh, satisfied. The initial statement of reasons, we call it the ISOR, I-S-O-R, describes the purpose and rationale of each regulation and identifies the factual material that the agency has used in proposing the regulatory changes. And then the response to these comments that the public or the regulatory lobbyist has made in writing and or verbally at a hearing are, and the responses by that agency are included in the FSOR, the final statement of reasons. And in fact, that FSOR document has to demonstrate that each relevant timely comment has actually been considered and either accepted or rejected by the agency. You know, regardless of the form of advocacy, legislative or regulatory in the venue, it's always important for the advocate to make effective in-person presentations, either in office visits or before legislative or regulatory public hearings. You know, you should expect the unexpected, uh, be aware of your audience and uh, potential questions that might be posed. Be sure to stay on point and within the time limits that you're given in your presentation. Always be honest. Uh, any lies or half-truths or deceitful conduct will ruin the advocate. And remember that these presentations play an important role in your advocacy efforts.